Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas Dillard. He served in the very well-respected 82nd Airborne Division and is a veteran of World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. And Colonel, thanks very much for being with us. Let's start at the very beginning. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and on the 14th of September, 1925. So I was a teenager when I enlisted in the Army at age 16. So that would be 1941. Was that right after Pearl Harbor then? Well, actually, uh, 1942, a year later. I see. What was your reaction as a teenager when you heard the news about Pearl Harbor? A little different for me because my stepfather was in the Army and we lived just outside of the gates of Fort McPherson, Georgia, and he was in the only signal battalion that the Army had at that time. And they deployed to North Africa for the landing in Africa and I just couldn't wait to go. So I was all charged up and, uh, and he had already gone. He was involved in the, uh, the landing there in North Africa. And I just I saw these advertisements for the paratroopers, and that's what I wanted to do. Now, so, enlisting at 16, was that okay then, or did you have to? No, I had <laughs> to, to fudge a little bit and, I, and twist my mother's arm to sign the papers because one was still supposed to be at least 18. And I knew the sergeant major that ran the recruiting office because I uh, spent a lot of time at Fort McPherson and caddied for the officers there. That's how I learned to play golf. But uh, the sergeant major, he knew, and he just turned his head and uh, said, well, I guess your, your family knows what they're doing. So he didn't question that. And you picked Airborne. Why would you pick Airborne? Well, they, they had a really good campaign going, and uh, they had posters uh, showing guys in parachutes, and I, I really, it, it caught my, the, as a matter of fact, it caught the imagination, I think, of many of the, the young men because, uh, you know, armor with the tanks and everything had been the, the big attraction until the paratrooper came on the scene. And once that started, they didn't have any trouble at all recruiting volunteers, and I think that the uh, 11th Airborne Division average age of the, the men, not necessarily the officers in the division, was around 21. So you can see it was a very youthful group of soldiers that comprised the Ar Army Airborne as we now refer to it. Where did you go to train? Uh, to uh, Well, I went to basic training at Camp Walters, Texas. And uh, at that point you could volunteer for the to, for, it, for the paratroopers. That's what it was called at that time. Now we say airborne. But uh, instructors from Fort Benning came and we had to go through a very strenuous physical exercise to prove that we could uh, do as many push-ups or as many tumbles as they wanted because we were determined that we were going to go to the airborne school. And uh, then we went to uh, Fort Benning. I did, was there in November 1942. And uh, several people that, was, that had served with me in basic training also we're in the same uh, class with me at Fort Benning, class of in November 1942. And uh, we finished that uh, uh, training, and then we went in what they call the frying pan at Fort Benning. And the frying pan was just an area there where you were waiting for an assignment. You finish your parachute school, you went into the holding area, which we call the frying pan, and then you were assigned a unit, airborne units, as they were activated because they were in the process of really activating the units for World War II. And uh, in my case, there were 500 of us in the frying pan at that time, and we were all assigned to the 551st Parachute Entry Battalion. They were shipped to Panama, and we were uh, organized at see the colonel. We were about two days out of Norfolk, Virginia, and the colonel came on the, on the uh, loudspeaker system and told us that we were no, now part of the 551st Parachute Infantry Battalion and we were going to Panama. And we, our mission in Panama was to prepare to jump on the island of Martinique because it was controlled by the Vichy French government. And uh, the fear was that it could be used as a submarine re refueling point for either German or Japanese submarines. And about two weeks before we were ready to jump, they changed their allegiance, the government of Martinique, to Charles de Gaulle. And that, of 
course, ended the need for that uh, airborne operation. So our unit then came back through the United States at Camp McCall and did retraining rather than jungle training in Panama to European type warfare for about four months before we deployed to, uh, to North Africa. And when did you deploy to North Africa? It was uh, April of uh, 1943. And what was your mission there? I know ultimately well, we, you we were, were uh, our battalion was scheduled to go to Anzio and reinforce the effort there in Italy. But as we approached the Straits uh, uh, at uh, Straits of Gibraltar, we were attacked by uh, German aircraft, and my my battalion had been split because we had two companies on on one Liberty ship and the other companies on another Liberty ship. And the other ship was damaged by the airstrikes that the Germans were uh, strafing the convoy. And it had to put in the Gibraltar for repairs. But uh, my ship was okay, so we went on into Algiers. And we were there for about a week until they had repaired the ship and it came to Algiers and the battalion was united again. And then we went to Italy. Well, by that time, the mission to go to Anzio had been changed and we were designated to go and get ready to jump into southern France for the Operation Dragoon. So we spent uh, about two months, the better part of two months in Sicily, doing very rough physical training to get ready for the jump into southern France, which we did on the 15th of August, 1944. What was the training consisting of? Uh, a, lot of <coughs> a lot of running uh, or jogging, if you please. Uh, particularly in the sand along the shore there where it made it much rougher to to run. And I, the, the idea there is that we will all be in splendid physical condition for the operation. And then there were a couple of, uh, of uh, amphibious landings that we participated in in the event the weather changed and rather than go, air, going in by parachute, we might have to go in on a landing craft. So. It was very intensive with the physical uh, training for us and some marksmanship training, re refresher training, if you will, because we had already completed a lot of, uh, of firing of different weapons, including the bazooka, which was new to everyone, uh, at Camp McCall, North Carolina, before we deployed to Europe. And the, that training came in worthwhile later after we were on the ground. We're talking with the retired U.S. Army Colonel uh, Douglas Dillard. He's a veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division. And, sir, you mentioned that Operation Dragoon uh, launched in August of 1944. Obviously, a lot was going on in the European theater at that point. Uh, Patton's on his way uh, to Paris. Uh, within the next several days, the breakout is happening. What was the target of Operation Dragoon down there in southern France? Well, the, the 7th Army, and it was comprised of units like the 3rd, uh, 36th, and 45th Entry Divisions from Italy, made the, land, the, the water landing, and we jumped 50 miles inland to block the roads leading towards the beach. And the idea was to open up a second front and go up the, the 7th Army would proceed up the Rhone Valley and join up with the forces of northern France. And it would also facilitate the movement of logistics supplies that were desperately needed on the northern front. And, you know, Patton was constantly restrained from moving forward because the, the, a lot of the petrol that was available was reallocated to Montgomery's force and taken away from Patton. So he'd just have to sit and wait for a while until they got logistical support. So there were, I think, two objectives. One was to open up another logistical source for northern France by, from Toulon and Marseille. And our airborne task force then moved along the Riviera coast to the Italian border and uh, pushed the German forces. It was a threat from the right flank of 7th Army until the forces in Italy had moved up north of our position in France. And uh, uh, when that occurred, then I, the mission for the airborne was uh, finished. And we then were uh, reallocated or I guess you would say reassigned to 18th Airborne Corps that was then in northern France. And uh, we loaded up on uh, uh, a train and were taken up to a French fort where we were there for two or three days before the Battle of the Bulge happened. Let me back up to Operation Dragoon for just a moment because that's the first combat, direct combat, 
that you were involved with after roughly two years of training and planning for, for such a thing. So yeah. after all that planning and training, what was it like to actually engage the enemy? Well, it was a relief because everybody, as you say, we had gone through a lot of training and we felt that we that our unit was the best one in the Airborne or in the Army. You feel that way with your unit. And uh, the, the training really paid off once we were on the ground. The, the second day that my battalion was on the ground in France, we captured, I think it's the only one, we captured a German Major General in his command post. And he then, then being debriefed, told us where the Corps Commander Lieutenant General was hiding out in a bunker outside of Dragon, you know, the city that we captured. So my company went out on patrol and surrounded the bunker. And uh, the uh, German general sent his aide out who w could speak English. And, and he told the, our interpreter that the general could not surrender to less than another general officer. He was a lieutenant general, the German. So we outpost the uh, bunker. And the next morning, the 36th Infantry Division relieved us in that sector. And the their assistant division commander, who was a breeder general, uh, accepted General Neuling's surrender. So uh, we were very pleased uh, and, uh, and felt very proud of the fact that, that we had not only captured one major general in his office, but we had also led to the uh, location and the capture of the Corps commander a few miles outside of the city. So we're very elated over uh, that. And it was just the you know, determination and uh, persistence that our unit had in moving forward that uh, accomplished that. Colonel, we're going to pause right there for a short break. When we come back, we'll head to the Battle of the Bulge. This right. is Veterans Chronicles. Okay. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus, honored to be joined in studio today by retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas Dillard, veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division. He is also a veteran of World War II. Korea and Vietnam. Uh, during the previous segment, we talked about him joining the paratroopers in the 82nd Airborne and uh, the training that took place and ultimately onto Operation Dragoon, the first combat uh, with the enemy in the European theater. And sir, you sort of set the stage a little bit earlier uh, in the last segment about how all the elements came together for the Battle of the Bulge when, when your unit heard about what was happening up in that area, where were you at the time? We, we, as we, when we moved up from southern France, we were garrisoned in, in Lyon, France at an old French fort. And we immediately began to, to uh, do training again. We had a lot of German prisoners there that did the police and, and cleaning the, the, the fort of the caserne cleaned up. And we were, there all, we were only there for three or four days and uh, I was, uh, a, a sergeant at that time, the communication sergeant for A Company at the 551st, and the charge of quarters came around about two o'clock in the morning, and said the the company commander wants all the, the non-commissioned officers to come to the order room. So uh, we went down there, and he then told us he said the Germans have broken through on the front. No one really knows where the front is, and we have to be right packed and ready to leave here at six o'clock in the morning as soon as the trucks arrived and we'll go up attached to the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, see what we can do to uh, uh, stop the German uh, breakthrough. And uh, uh, we were ready, but we, we had to wait almost a full day before the trucks came. And when they arrived, they were all open bed truck, two and a half ton trucks. Mm -hmm. And the beds were full of five gallon jerry cans full of gasoline. So you're sitting in an open bed truck, it's sleeting and snowing, and your feet and legs are stretched out over these five gallon gasoline cans. So uh, you know, anything could have happened if a, a round had hit those gasoline cans. But anyway, uh, we drove up into uh, Belgium, and as we approached one town there, March and Hotten, the German SS had already crossed the uh, creek on the other side of the village and they were coming into town. So we had to turn our convoy around and take a, a circuitous route up to Verbamont where the 82nd Airborne Division headquarters was located. And as soon as we arrived there, we were told we were going to, to support the 30th Infantry Division up on the northern flank. And that's where Battle Group Comp, uh, Joachim Piper 
was the spearhead for the German breakthrough and their target was Antwerp. And the 82nd and the 30th ID really held the, the northern shoulder and, the, and once that began and they realized that the German forces, they couldn't move, they began moving further south and ended up with the situation in Bastogne. But uh, my battalion, we went up to uh, the 30th Division and we were the, the reserve for the 30th Division because they'd committed all their battalions. And they had Joachim Piper surrounded on the north and we were there for, uh, I guess maybe two days and then we reverted to control of the 82nd Airborne, moved back down into their area and on the 27th of December, the battalion was tasked to go out and collect information. So we infiltrated out to about 4,000 meters in the, but behind the German lines to gather intelligence. And during that night, we killed about 100 Germans, took some prisoners, destroyed a half track, and uh, came back through the line. We lost one man that night. And General Gavin was waiting at the outpost and said, guys, you did a good job. I'm really proud of you. So you know, that made everybody feel great that he would be there. But that's, that's the way he was. And we then went in the rest period until the 3rd of January. And on the 3rd is when the big counterattack was launched by the Allied forces. And the idea there was to push the Germans back uh, west of the, I'm sorry, east of the Somme River, which would clear them uh, out completely and help straight in the front line rather than it being 82nd line uh, like that it would be it would be straight where the Germans having been pushed all the way back and and during that period of time uh, on the third we had we suffered a lot of losses had several officers killed and NCOs and on the fourth the morning of the fourth uh, Lieutenant Durkee had put the what was left of A company back together which is re really about two platoons about 60 men and as we were moving, he, he noticed the, uh, the German machine gun positions that were about to fire on other elements of our battalion. And he uh, ordered the bayonet attack. So my company is the one that, that conducted one of the rare bayonet attacks during uh, World War II. And during that period, we killed about 84 Germans, or 84 enemy, and destroyed three machine guns. And uh, it seemed like but it lasted forever, but it wasn't. It was only a few minutes, and it was all over. And we then reconstituted the company, reorganized, and moved up to a line overlooking the final objective, which was the Somme River. And we could see, as the train sloped down, we could see down at the bottom is where the river would be. And there was a one village there that was fortified. And uh, on the seventh, on the, the seventh of January. The battalion launched an attack to capture that fortified village, and my company's on the left flank, and we ran into really heavy machine gun fire, and uh, the, my company commander was killed in just a few minutes from once the attack started, and the rest of A Company was shot up so bad that we had about six men left in the company. So Lieutenant Durkee. Uh, realizing the situation altered the remainder of our walking wounded to move back and they reported to uh, the exec because at the same time that my company commander was killed our battalion commander was killed also from artillery fire and we didn't know that but uh, the executive officer then ordered a company to move back in the reserve there's nothing left of a company really and in b and c company with a tank that finally showed up made the final attack on the village and the Germans uh, surrendered about 400 that were dug in around that village and they surrendered because we had the bridge, the only bridge left over the Somme River, we had it cut so they couldn't escape. So they realized they should give up and, and uh, the battalion then, we, we only had uh, 98 people left in the battalion out of 600 as we went into Belgium and the General Gavin came down. The company was, what I mean, the battalion, what was left of it was moved to Jerusalemville, Belgium for a couple of days of rest. And General Gavin came down and said, I hate to tell you this, but we don't have replacements to uh, reorganize and reinforce the 551. So 
it's going to be deactivated, and you guys are all going to that are still uh, for duty. You're going to be assigned to different regiments in the 82nd Airborne. So uh, that ended the the life of the 551st there on the 8th of January 1945. Sir, and let's pause right there. We'll take another quick break and yeah. come right back on Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles on the Radio America Network. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for being with us. Our guest today in studio is the retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas Dillard, veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division and a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, sir, there's obviously a number of elements about the Battle of the Bulge that uh, have become well known in the 70 plus years since the battle. One is simply the elements, uh, the frigid temperatures. What are your recollections of that? It was uh, brutal, the weather. And the other thing, which I didn't mention, when we came up from southern France, we still were wearing our summer weight uniforms. Mm -hmm. Some of us had the wool, the woolen shirt and trousers, but you wear that in the, in the summer also. So when we went in the bowls, we were really not prepared. And again, it's a, it was a logistic problem that the, uh, I think I really fault Eisenhower and, and Bradley for not having saw that. But the logistics were awful. So a lot of, I was wearing leather boots and a jump, jump suit and I tried to find some extra, uh, what we call a, a driver's coat or mechanic coat. It's a three quarter length coat that's, that's pretty good pretty warm and uh, you see an assortment of, of people with different types of uh, clothing on in order to stay warm but the you know we when we started up there it was sleeting and snowing and uh, it continued until a, the point where we we're making those attacks we were uh, sometime waist deep or at least knee deep in the snow and the ground was frozen so you couldn't dig a foxhole so you just had if you uh, trying to find some cover you just find, try and find tree branches or things of that sort to make a little hutch that you could get under because you couldn't break the surface of the ground. It was totally frozen. And a lot of people in our unit uh, were uh, affected with trench foot, uh, rather uh, trench foot, frostbite, particularly frostbite, and uh, were, you were evacuated. Uh, and that was a really a bad situation for all the troops that were in the Battle of the Bulge because they were just logistically were not prepared for it. And then in terms of the battle itself, the Germans knew this was probably their last best chance to turn the tide of the of the Western Front in Europe. What did you sense about their desperation, their ferocity as they made their stand there? In our case, we're on the 3rd of January, when we started to counterattack, we our main opponent was the 63rd Volks Grenadier Division, and uh, they were scattering a, a ninth uh, SS Panzer uh, support troops uh, in that group, and they felt like they're going to win the battle. And I I never saw any any desperation on their part. They, they were they were there to fight, and they fought, and they fought very honorably. Uh, and uh, uh, there may be, you know, some instances where uh, uh, a German deserted or uh, or indicated that they they knew the end was in sight. But I, I never witnessed any of that. I really didn't. And to give you an, a good example, uh, Joachim Piper, who's well known, Colonel Piper was a super warrior in the German army, and he was leading Comp Group Piper which was the lead armored element headed towards Antwerp. And when he got near the village of Leglise, the, the 30th ID on the north stopped him and the 82nd Airborne, the 504 parachute entry was on the south and he got bottled up in Leglise and he had, he had about 1,200 American prisoners, I mean, he had wounded. And he had his troops, which was little, I guess around 1,000 German troops, plus armor and other vehicles that just couldn't move because they they were running out of fuel, they were, had technical problems, and they had Americans surrounding them. And yet, Piper detailed the group to stay there with the vehicles and the, and the artillery and at a certain time to destroy them, set fire, uh, uh, take the breech blocks out and throw them away. And then he took 700 of his men 
and actually exfiltrated through, our, we're not proud of this fight, but exfiltrated through our lines and got back to the German line. So, uh, you know, there's absolutely no, no indication that, that they were frantic and desperate. They were desperate in fighting to you know, try and make their way to Antwerp, but the, the spirit was still there. Quick follow-up on a point you made earlier in our conversation about what it meant to you to have such high praise from General Gavin. Overall, what was your assessment of him as the leader? <clears throat> During my career of 35 years in the Army, <clears throat> I tried to pattern myself after the examples that I have seen uh, in daily with, with General Gavin and later with General Ridgway. And I always tried to uh, act the way I thought that they would because they were both troop oriented. You could never tell where, where General Gavin is going to show up on the outposts, uh, back on parade, anywhere. And the night that we came back through the lines, he was down there with his aide, but he carried an M1 rifle. And, and I know that on one occasion he, he used it uh, when he was uh, surprised by. So that was a real, it was like a traffic jam in Belgium during the Bulge. And one of the people in our company sat down in a fire break to take a smoke and a guy sat down behind him and they were back to back and he smoked a cigarette when they got through and they got up and looked around and the other guy was a German. That's how confused things were. <laughs> so they parted company, one ran one way and one ran the other but uh, it was really a, a confused situation for a while because of the both U.S. and American stragglers wandering around in those dense woods, forests. Amazing, amazing. We could spend so much more time on, oh, yeah. on World War II, but let's uh, move to Korea. You s decided to stay in the service uh, at the conclusion of, of World War II, and where did you find yourself when the Korean War broke out? I, I, re -enli I was an enlisted man. I was you know, a first sergeant, and... Uh, I was reassigned to the 82nd, and uh, I got a direct commission at the end of the war as a second lieutenant. And when the Korean War uh, broke out, I was in, in the 82nd, and we were levied for about 200 officers to go to Korea. And we all went about the same time in the latter part of uh, 51, and uh, I'm sorry, 50. and. Uh, uh, when I, when uh, my my best buddy that had been with me during World War II, he had a childhood friend that was a colonel in Eisenhower's, I mean, uh, MacArthur's headquarters. So when we arrived in Japan, he called him and, and said, my mother told me that I should call you and let you know that I'm here and so forth and blah, 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 you know, you know renewing their friendship. And uh, he said, where are you guys going? We said, I know we're, we're infantry officers. We'll be platoon leaders probably. We're one of the divisions. And he said, well, they're organizing a new unit there, and they need combat experience parachutists. So would you guys be interested? And we said, well, anything could be better than being an infantry platoon leader. <laughs> Didn't turn out that way. But uh, we then were uh, uh, picked up from the camp and taken down Tokyo. And, and briefed on the fact we were going into the uh, a cl uh, classified organization that operated behind the lines. And we were to recruit uh, Korean uh, partisans and reinforced by some Chinese that were sent from Taiwan. And when I arrived there, I was the airborne qualified guy, and I took over the airborne operations section, and I trained and dropped agents and partisans all over North Korea and Southern Manchuria. And I lost one uh, plane load of, uh, of, uh, of people uh, because a Chinese agent had managed to worm his way in the system and he threw a grenade in the plane as he jumped out and blew it up and, and of course that caused the loss of, uh, of a handful. I had two jump masters that were, were lost and there were several Chinese agents on board that plane that were also killed. But uh, my buddy went, he became the logistics officer, but later, a month later, when a, a quartermaster officer came in, he was reassigned and, and worked for me as my assistant. And we ran all the airborne operations at night during the moon phase in North Korea. And we did resupply, radio intercept, and agent drops uh, all over North Korea and right on the, the edge of Manchuria around Sevastopol. 
uh, Sevastopol is the Russian port city and then around the, along the Yellow River. And uh, for a while, a friend of mine was uh, he volunteered to extend his tour. And he went on leave and they asked me if I'd go up and run the, t the tactical liaison office with the 1st Marine Division. And I said, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And I went up and uh, took over his team. And what we would do is we had Korean agents in civilian clothes. And we would take them through the front line. And we had to work with the Marines there on the outpost line. We'd take them forward to the outpost at a designated location and dispatch them. And they would work their way around in the villages where the Chinese troops were. And they'd stay there one or two days on the designated return date. They'd come back to that point. We would meet them and bring them back through the Marine lines. And that was a tactical intelligence. And we had a team with every frontline division that did that. The partisans were principally on the offshore islands on the west coast from the Yellow River all the way down the, uh, uh, through the, the Huang Hei uh, province, which is right along the, the, what is now the DMZ. And uh, we run operations almost every night, uh, landings on the, on the mainland or the peninsula, and do sabotage, uh, uh, try and capture prisoners, uh, disrupt the activities that are going on. And what this did, as a result of this partisan activity on the West Coast, the uh, Chinese had to, to detail a full division, take them away from the front, and put them on that coast to act against the partisan uh, operations. And that was good because it relieved you know, a certain number of uh, combat troops opposing ours on the front line. And uh, uh, I had many, many narrow escapes with the, the, the drops because we were flying in C-47. And when we got up near Mig Alley, you had to be very, very careful because of the, the bogies. They would, they would come, they would not come down too far in the South, the South Korean area because our Air Force has really shot them up. But they did operate along the Yellow River, so you're up there at daybreak of the beginning of nautical morning twilight, uh, had to be really concerned. And uh, the Navy had their night raiders or the, patrolling the area, and it was always good. You stand in the door of the plane and see that Navy jet come up alongside and the guy wiggle his wings and wave at you. You knew that at least he was there to help protect you in case a North Korean uh, aircraft appeared. Now, that what you just described was the start of a major shift in your career all the way to your retirement where military intelligence really became your focal point. You've even been inducted in the Military Intelligence Hall of Fame. What appealed to you, what, what about it appealed to you so much? Uh, I, guess it was, I guess maybe the, the potential for intrigue and uh, being able to accomplish something on your own you, you're not with an organ, I mean with a formation of troops. In Europe I worked, I had the Czech team for a while and I ran agents myself in Austria and across the, the German-Czech border and out of Berlin. And uh, it was a, a sense of personal satisfaction that I was, you know, as a Georgia boy with a bad drawl and I spoke <laughs> Czech with a Polish accent, my, one of my agents <laughs> told me. But uh, I got a lot of satisfaction from being able to do that. And, and I had to do it on my own. I you know, didn't have anyone out telling me uh, how to do this or covering my back. And uh, in Berlin, they, uh, they had a, uh, a warning that the uh, uh, East Germans uh, and I think the KGB had a, a uh, reward or a bonus for anyone that could capture one of the American agents and bring him back into uh, the Eastern Zone. And so we would go up there, we then would go in pairs so that, that we could cover each other because at night in the safe house there in Berlin, you had to be extremely careful uh, in moving around until you got your agent dispatched and, uh, and you go back to the western zone. So it was, it was, I guess, the attraction of the intrigue and the, the ability to personally do that on your own without uh, being with a formation as you would be, you know, with a regular infantry, airborne infantry unit. Mm. 
And I studied Czech for a year at the Army Language School before I went to Europe. And uh, that was very helpful. But one of my agents did joke about it. And he said, you know, you got the, the darndest accent. He said, you talk like a Pole when you speak Czech. <laughs> I said, well, good. <laughs> well, folks are always noticing your accent probably, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, just about a minute before our next break here, uh, Colonel. Uh, other than the European assignments between Korea and Vietnam, was there anything else you did between any other stations you had between Korea and Vietnam? Uh, I was uh, I went, attended the Army Language School, as I said, and I, and I studied Czech, and I had the Czech team in Europe, and uh, as an interim period. Uh, in running operations, so I came back and I taught at the intelligence school. I was sent back to Europe, and this time I was on the general staff in Heidelberg in the intelligence division. And I came back to the States uh, on short notice to go to Vietnam. And I ended up, when I arrived in Vietnam, uh, the infamous Phoenix program, which is not infamous for me because we, we control it. Uh, but. I had the the whole Mekong Delta, which is thirty percent of the population in Vietnam, uh, to work, and I worked under the supervision of the CIA at that time because they they were running the program. And uh, the first thing that I did with all this bad publicity that had gone before, I told all of my people I had about two hundred uh, military intelligence officers out in each district in the Delta. And I told them that if I find that you're involved in torture, and I really emphasize this, I will personally see that you're court-martialed. We, we're not going to do that uh, as long as I'm here. And if I get any indication at all, you'll be relieved. If, it's, if it can first charges against you, we'll do that. We never had that problem. We did with the Vietnamese every now and then. Uh, I remember in Phuong Hep, we went down there and they had the uh, Viet Cong had come in to raid the village, and they captured one of the the uh, cadre of the Viet Cong, and the, our advisor was on his way down the canal to uh, take possession of him, and they killed him. So he got down and he said, why did you kill him? And he said, well, he wanted to die. And that, that was the, it, it was a really potential good source of information. That's, we didn't want to kill him, we wanted to get the intelligence from him. And there were a lot of them that, that defected. The Chu Hoi program was pretty good, and they defected, and we recruited uh, people then to work for us. And uh, we had what was known as a, uh, a province unit of about 100 troops, and most of them were North Vietnamese. And they were light infantry, and they worked in each province. So we would use them out on the different raids and ambush sites that were, uh, that were conducted. But uh, just to give you an idea. The first day I was th there for duty, I wanted to go up to the Cambodian border. It was the Chowduck province. So I had my own helicopter, the CIA Air America. So we're flying up there and we get a mayday call and it was an American with an advisor. And he said, I have a man that stepped on the mine and it blew his leg off and and I can't get the dust off, which is the, the normal army evac uh, helicopter. And I, I need the help. And the pilot said, well, it's your plane. What do you want to do? And I said, well, we give him help. So we went down and hovered over the paddy. And we got him up and put him in the plane. And uh, and there was blood. We splattered all over everybody and in the plane, too. I knew he was not going to make it because he'd already turned that color that I've seen so many times. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we took him back to the village and dropped him off. And later we found out, yeah, he, he died right away. So I go up to the village in Chowduck, we're up there about 30 minutes later, and the, the advisor, my advisor meets me in the Jeep and we go out to the little village, he says, I want to show you something. So we're out there and there's a young couple, um, uh, I don't think they'd been married very long, and they had been sympathizers with our uh, advisors. And the Viet Cong came in that night and shot them in the air, both of them. And they and put their bodies on a cart in the middle of the village as a warning, you don't help the Americans. So that was my first day in Vietnam. I thought, what in the devil is going to unfold for the, this next year? And it was, it was like that off and on. But 
that made a uh, a tremendous impression on me that the uh, the threats that the people that, that helped us were confronted with with the secret army, as they call their their guerrilla forces, uh, and the, uh, the regular Viet Cong agents. Just a couple minutes remaining in our conversation, sir. Uh, as you were coordinating attacks on the Viet Cong, I believe mostly in the Mekong Delta area, yeah. um, what was determined to be the Viet Cong's greatest vulnerability? What tactics seemed to work most effectively against them? The, well, number one, working with the, the villagers to get information. And the other thing was attrition. We, we did our, our best to locate them and either uh, get them to, to ch join the Chu Hoi program as a defector or we kill them. And the attrition really uh, had an effect because we were very, very active. And, and we discovered that it was just before I left that the, uh, uh, there was such a shortage now of volunteers in the Delta for working for the Viet Cong that they were sending people down from North Vietnamese, North Vietnam to replace the people they couldn't replace locally. So we were, we were on the way to uh, winning that battle against the, uh, the Viet Cong infrastructure. I know in the Delta and up in other areas, I was not that knowledgeable of it, but I know that we were making tremendous success down there uh, among the, uh, the cadre for the Viet Cong. It was our activity influence people to not readily volunteer to help these people like collecting taxes or setting, uh, doing sabotage or things of that sort. And uh, many of them then did rally and gave us information about where these uh, cadre were, were operating. And they were still holdouts. I remember one village that we'd have to fly in like they do in, ba in, in Baghdad these days. I didn't realize that until the other day, but we would fly in and land and a chopper would immediately take off and he'd fly away in orbit at three or 4,000 feet until we had finished our visit. Then we'd radio him to come in and he would come in just long enough to get on the chopper and get out of there because the Viet Cong were all around that village, ha village or hamlet. And uh, that's a just, that's the way it was. And uh, uh, it could be very dangerous. Uh, you could lose the chopper as well as a lot of people. Last question for you, sir, and I know we've only scratched the surface on your amazing career. What are you most proud of from your time in uniform? I think I, I'm really proud of the, uh, the performance that I saw among our troops and my battalion commander, whom I alluded to earlier, that was killed. He was uh, an, a splendid example of uh, uh, I guess taking, uh, being a true troop leader, he, would, he led from the front and he was very humane in his uh, attention to the troops and mixing among them like General Gavin. And I just take great pride, when I was in Atlanta last week at the annual Airborne Award Ceremony, I saw a lot of my old Airborne friends and we're uh, just as crazy and wild about supporting the Airborne as we've ever been. But, you know, we're very proud of them. Well, thank you, sir, for your service to our country, and thank you very much for your time today. Well, I enjoyed it, always do. I like to, <laughs> to talk when I have the chance. To... <laughs> Retired U.S. Army Colonel Douglas Dillard served with the 82nd Airborne Division. He's a veteran of World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. I'm Greg Corumbus for Veterans Chronicles.